you for the opportunity to tell you about an amazing adventure, a life-changing experience, a lesson in humility and pride, a realization of my own insignificance and the opportunity to set a lofty goal and achieve it. In November 2012, a year after the trek to Everest Base Camp and back, I published a coffee table book about the adventure. The book is available online for $100, including a $10 profit which is donated to the Maya Sherpa Project, a Nepalese NGO helping a small village in the remote Sulukumbu region of the Himalayas. Buying the book in bulk, my cost is $60. I ask for a $100 donation, all of which goes to the Maya Sherpa Project. Trekking to Everest Base Camp was for me a high physical, spiritual and emotional adventure. I will attempt to relive that experience, or at least some of the highlights, with you, as the words of Psalm 121 continue to course through my brain as they did each day in the Himalayas. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. While on the mountain, I wrote the following poem. Everest, Sagarmata. I have seen amazing things. I have walked where eagles dare to fly. I have heard the glory of the mountain song, a heavenly miracle etched in my mind. I have lived the adventure of the sky and followed its call on my own two feet. My spirit soared like the condor when once more I stood at the place where mountain and heaven and I we're one. Sagarmata. I held the mountain of that sacred name in my hand. Oh, I covered this memory of human endeavor. And because of it, my life is changed forever. I have stood at the top of Africa and now at the base of the mother of all mountains. I have gazed upon the vast mountain's plot, and whilst beholding this wonder, have wondered at those who proclaim, there is no God. What higher spiritual blessing, what loftier physical feat than to be filled with pride while humbled by this goal achieved. I have stood at the base of Mount Everest. Oh. To once more gaze upon the glory of that mountain's grandeur and to caress the morning sun's life force perched atop Kalapatar, surrounded by mountain peaks with magical names like Lotse, Nupse, Pumori, Tamserku, Amadablam the Jewel, and Mount Everest the Crown. Just once more. And I know now where my limits lie, there where eagles dare to fly. And I went beyond. Kathmandu. What a magical name. What mystery and intrigue surrounded that name. I was almost trembling with anticipation as our plane glided onto the runway, the snow-capped peaks of the Himalayas having been visible for hundreds of miles off our port wing, reaching skyward above a dense cloud cover. We made our way into the chaos of the city. After more than an hour in absolute traffic hell, which I found most exciting, we finally made it into the Tamil area, a chaotic haven of less disastrous proportions. We arrived at the very adequate Hotel Manang at the edge of Tamil. The famous mountaineer Anatoly Bukriev, who died in an avalanche on K2 in 1995, writes in his book, The Climb, Tragic Ambitions on Everest. 
In Kathmandu, the air on most days is polluted with a suspension of heavy metals from the exhaust of diesel engines and airborne particles of human waste, which irritate the lungs and can cause respiratory illnesses. Also, a scatter of bacteria are found in some restaurants and in market foods that can lead to gastrointestinal problems. Either of these maladies, if a climber falls prey to them, can seriously impact his or her potential to perform. So for those coming to Nepal to climb Everest, one of the first challenges is to leave Kathmandu healthy. Our second day in Kathmandu was an orientation day, and we spent the morning at the offices of our outfitter, Himalaya Journey Treks and Expeditions Office in Tamil. Ram Pahari, the owner, manager of coverage of the next 16-day hike and adventure was exhaustive and complete. During the briefing, Ram referred to our group of six in airline parlance as six-packs, meaning passengers. We immediately started calling ourselves the six-pack. Today, we were to fly to Lukla to start our trek. We arrived at the airport in the pre-dawn dark and the place was chaos. We were rushed through security and to the airport tax counter, the check-in counter, through more security, all the while being urged to hurry because the flight would leave exactly at six o'clock. We hurried and gathered at the departure gate, excited about departing on the small plane to Lukla. Finally, at 3.45 p.m., no flights to Lukla today. We were very disappointed. But we were pleased that the authorities took no chances when it came to the weather. Landing at Lutla is dangerous. We had come to like the local beer, named, what else? Everest. So as we contemplated our position and options, I said, I know what we will do. If you can't climb it, drink it. We took to the streets of Tamel for libation and dinner and hit the sack at about 8 p.m. Unfortunately, Kent and I were both up at 3 a.m. with a stomach problem. We hoped it would be temporary. Kent said it was healthy diarrhea. Not taking any chances, I took an emodium. The itinerary entry for today said Fak Ding trek to Nam Shi Bazaar. We were still in Kathmandu. After breakfast, still making frequent short trips to the restroom, we settled in to wait for the word on the day's travels. Ram called and told us that there were no flights to Lukla. Thousands of trekkers were by now stranded at Lukla, unable to fly out. In Kathmandu, the weather was perfect, but hundreds of trekkers were arriving and were stuck in Kathmandu. We had only one option now, and that was to go by helicopter the next day. But at 1 p.m., I got a call from Ram. The weather in the mountains had improved, and he had a helicopter standing by. Okay, what do you think? Maybe? Everest. We piled into the minivan and braved the traffic back to the airport for the third time in as many days. We frantically shoved our bags onto the security scanner conveyor and subjected ourselves to the pat-down for the third time in as many days. Everyone was excited as we were met by the helicopter company's manager who assured us the helicopter is waiting with engines running and the pilot in his seat. We are just waiting for the air controller's clearance. And then we waited. We sat around on our bags since there were no chairs in this section of the airport. Kent crashed on the only bench. Just after 4 p.m., the manager informed us that the flight has been cancelled, but that we were priority for tomorrow morning, first flight out. As we reloaded our backpacks into the minibus, Ram was operating three cell phones at once to try to find his accommodation for the night. He called 18 hotels and not one had a room. I called all the five-star hotels. They are all full, he said. I called all the four-star, the three-star and the two-star hotels. They are also full. As he shook his head, keeping his cool. Well, what about the one-star hotels? I asked. They are also full. The problem was that with all the flights cancelled for the past three days, the city was filling up with folk coming in to climb, but they couldn't get to look to start their trek. We were told that there were over 2,000 trekkers stranded at Lukla. Ram continued to work his magic with his three phones. Finally, he said, I found three rooms, but it's not a star hotel. It's just a regular hotel in the heart of Tomel. The Hotel Kathmandu view was basic but clean. We had a quick dinner and a hole in the wall and went straight to bed. I took another Imodium, definitely an essential drug on all these treks. Finally, on the last day possible, we were on. Rushing to the airport for the fourth time, we were whisked to the heliport to board a helicopter. 
the helicopter turned out to be a six-seater, but we were six plus the pilot, and by the way, we had gear for a three-week hike. No problem, we all squeezed into the available seats. I was seriously concerned that we may have overloaded the helicopter, particularly since I knew that the dangerous Lokla airstrip was at an altitude of almost 10,000 feet. Stefan, our young Scandinavian pilot, did not seem too concerned either. Nice to meet you, too. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Have you done this flight before? No, it's my first time. First time? Okay, good. Well, it's our first time, too. It was an incredible flight. Following the Dutkozi River, dodging mountain tops and seemingly missing cliff sides by inches. We landed at Turkey, a thousand feet below Bukla, adding a significant climb to our trek. We gathered our backpacks and walked past the throng of people stranded there hoping to get out by helicopter. I was fearing a riot as we pushed our way through the mass of people shouting, pleading and waving their hands in the air. We made it to the side of the clearing, wondering what to do next. Until a couple of hours before, we were supposed to land at Lokla, where we were to be met by our guide, Ramesh Karel, and our porters. It was already midday, and we knew we had a full day's trek to go. Suddenly, Ramesh appeared out of the fog. Kent had hiked in the Himalaya several years before, and Ramesh was his guide then. Ramesh had literally jogged the distance down the mountain from Lukla in about the same time it took us to fly from Kathmandu. And he was not even panting. I was breathing hard just standing still because we were now at 8,500 feet. And here we are from left to right, L. Wilson, our Sherpas Shiva Katuwell and Tika Basnet, our guide Ramesh Karel, Ken Stuckey, Pete McElroy, Roger Verney, Kathy Wilson and me. The six-pack was ready for the adventure. We set out at a fast pace since we needed to get to our first day's destination by nightfall. The going was immediately tough and steep as we made way for mule and yak caravans. It was surprisingly warm. We did not expect that. I was dressed for cold. Soon I was in a sweat and started dripping layers, but a little too late. A good lesson to learn. One does not wear cotton underwear on these tracks. We crossed the Dude Crossy River several times on suspension bridges several hundred feet above the torrent of white glacier-fed water rushing down the mountain, continuing the millions of years of carving a deep wound through the Himalayas. The views were spectacular, even with the mountains concealed in the fog and the river shrouded in the mist far below. Namaste. White lunch. Namaste. Because there are no roads. Everything trackers and the locals need in the Himalayas is brought in on foot. Oh. We hiked and climbed eight hours that first day, once a while stopping to rest and enjoy the culture of the people living here. We came across a lovely family, the two daughters, no more than six or seven, giving huge baskets of fodder from the field up to the trail. Families living and working together. <laughs> At the entrance to each village was a wall with inscriptions dividing the trail as well as a shrine containing prayer drums. We learned that the custom is to stay to the left of these ancient religious monuments, turning the prayer drum three times to for a travel blessing of Um Mane Padme Um which is inscribed on the drums and on the Mani stones, a prayer for our safe journey. It's getting to be dark, Still eh? hidden above the clouds, the sun went down unseen and the temperatures dropped to freezing. It was dark almost instantly. We made it to our tea house for the night. So we arrived here in the dark and this wonderful lady came and met us with a flashlight. Yeah. How, halfway down the mountain, thank you. <laughs> what is your name? Here we are, our first dinner on the mountain. Everybody all, none the worse for wear. 
The food was great, the hospitality amazing, and the yard dung fire stove in the kitchen dining area severely aromatic, but warm. The beds were basic, but comfortable, with no blankets. I curled up in my sleeping bag, making sure that I had two essentials with me. My Nalgene Wide Neck Drinking Water Bottle, and my trusted Nalgene White Neck Pea Bottle, the one with the large silver P here written on it so as not to confuse the two in the night. We were up early, refreshed and ready for the next day's challenge from Fatting to Nam Che Bazaar. We said goodbye to our hosts in the early morning fog. We were surprised that we were not in pain from the previous day's extreme exertion and thought that bode well for this day's trek to Namche Bazaar, a total elevation change of almost 2,200 feet, no doubt with significant ascents and descents along the way. We climbed through lovely pine forests filled with rhododendron bushes, wildflowers decorating the trail side, passing beautiful waterfalls, following the course of the Dutkozi River, the River of Milk, so named because of the milky color of the water rushing, cascading down the mountain and through the Dutkozi River Valley. Passing through several Sherpa villages, crossing the Dutkozi River for the third time this morning and yet another long suspension bridge, we arrived at the village of Jorsale, Twin Pines, at 9,680 feet, where we had lunch at the Nirvana Garden Tea House. Ramesh explained the hike for the rest of the day. First, we go back across the suspension bridge we had just crossed, he said. We follow along the Dutkozi Valley and then we have to go to 11,300 feet. So walking on this bridge is quite dramatic because it's very slippery and it sways and bounces. Before arriving at the Hillary Bridge, we have to climb pretty steep. And then after it will be a big climb to Namche Bazaar. Ramesh was not exaggerating. If anything, he undersold the difficulty of the next five hours of climbing. We walked along the riverbank for a while, crossing tributary streams on a couple of logs laid across, crossed two more suspension bridges, and after a steep climb, followed by a long, steep descent down to the river, we stopped to admire the sight of the Sir Edmund Hillary Bridge spanning the gorge of the Dutkozi River. At a height of 330 feet, the 700-foot-long bridge until recently was the highest suspension bridge in the world. We climbed the steep trail up to the Hillary Bridge. Bridge is totally bouncing up and down. On the other side, we were met with an incredibly steep and winding trail downward, barely three feet wide in places, the traffic extremely heavy. I had been setting my pace early on in the day, falling into the rhythm of the hike. Slowly, slowly, step, rest, step, rest. The Swahili, Pole, pole, slowly, slowly, coursing through my head. I learned that from our wonderful guides on Kilimanjaro in 2008. Not too fast, not too slowly. Pole, pole. I repeated these ingrained words multiple times that second day, particularly during the grueling uphill climb, sharing the trail on which Marco Polo once walked with a multitude of Sherpa porters and pack animals. Late afternoon, Very cold all after of a sudden, eight Roger. hours, exhausted and still in a dense fog, we were coming up on Namche Bazaar. Cold the climb cold. was brutal and exhausting. Namaste. We walked into Namche Bazaar and found our tea house. I paid two dollars per hour to charge my camera batteries, five dollars for a hot shower, ten dollars for an internet connection. I uploaded this short video trailer of our experience up to them to YouTube.
After a wonderful dinner of garlic noodles and rice, I crawled into my sleeping bag. My water bottle, headlamp and trusty pee bottle were within easy reach inside my sleeping bag. We were staying in Nanchi Bazaar two nights to allow for some rest and adjusting to the altitude. After a bowl of oatmeal, we took off for an acclimatizing climb to the Hotel Everest View. We're going to send Butsi at the Everest View Hotel. Highest located five star hotel in the world, which is located 3,900 meters. If the weather is clear from there, you can see the panoramic view of Lussi, Everest, Amadablam. Uh, the trail see. leading out of Namche Bazaar was very steep, and we were clearly feeling the effects of having slept the almost 11,500 feet and now climbing to more than 13,000 feet. Two guys carrying the rebar down the mountain. We were hoping that the dense cloud cover over the Himalayas would lift when we got to the Hotel Everest view. Well, I think it's beginning to get cold here. Fog rolling in, ice on the trees. Okay, this is a good example of how fit these guys are and how Resilient and tolerant. Look at the difference between their shoes. Are your feet cold? No. no? It was the third day of our trek, and we had yet to get a glimpse of the high mountain peaks that tantalizingly dangled before us by Ramesh. Well, Everest was out there somewhere. Our lunch was a cup of steaming hot garlic soup, good for the cold and an antidote for mountain sickness. The garlic was so strong I tasted the repeating garlic all the way back down the mountain to Namche Bazaar and until the next night in Tengboche, our next goal. In spite of the altitude, I slept remarkably well and woke refreshed and ready to go. Up to now, we had not seen a mountain peak because of the dense, low clouds enshrouding the Himalayas. I stepped out of the back door of the Kamal guest house to see if I could find a place to wash my face and brush my teeth. The three-story tea house had only one toilet with a very uninviting basin. Yes, running cold water, but the smell of the toilet serving 20 to 30 guests made it impossible to brush one's teeth there. It's not often that I can hold my breath the whole time while going to the bathroom, but in this small, cramped, smelly room at over 11,000 feet, I almost perfected that. As I stepped out the back door, I almost lost my breath, which I had just recovered from my smelly bathroom experience. The clouds had completely dissipated and I was greeted by a clear, blue, cold morning sky. My whole field of vision was overwhelmed by a stunning vista of Mount Komserku, basked in the bright early morning sunlight towering over Namche Bazaar at over 22,000 feet in elevation. The sheer mass of that mountain so close, having been hidden in the clouds for the past three days, was almost beyond belief. I turned to go to my room to get my camera, shaking with excitement from the effects of the bitter cold altitude and the shock of the view. As I turned, I was stunned by an equally impressive view of Mount Kongde on the other side of the valley, dominating the sky at over 19,700 feet. I don't remember if I actually brushed my teeth that morning, but I do know that I took many photos of these incredible views. We enjoyed another breakfast of oatmeal and momo, a deep fried dough laced with honey. Our backpacks packed and ready for the fourth day of our trek, I tarried a little in the dining room to enjoy the company of these wonderful Nepalese people just a little bit longer. I pulled out my MacBook Air and Skyped my son Thomas his wife Yuki and our grandson Rusei in Saigon, Vietnam. Our hostess, Mina, had a cute little daughter and the two kids made quite a connection, giggling at each other over the internet. Mina was convinced that we could arrange a betrothal and she was quite impressed to be talking with and seeing Tommy and Yuki in Vietnam. I was too, the marvel of modern technology. We set off on the trail from Namche Bazaar to Tengboche. As we climbed higher, we turned to take a last look at the Edmund Hillary Bridge, now more than a thousand feet below, as it spanned the Dude Kozi River in the bottom of the valley. 
For about an hour, we trekked at a steady speed. We came around a bend in the trail and suddenly, rising out of the river valley in the distance, etched against the cobalt blue sky, there stood Mount Everest. Still more than 20 miles and thousands of feet in up and down elevation changes, still four days trekking away. Small peak on the left hand side from the Everest. The range of the Nutsi. This is Amar Dabla Sejolari of the Nutsi. 6,856. Unbelievable. That was it. You're better than this, right? Awesome, incredible. Six pack! Six pack! Six pack! Sorry. We paid our respects as we admired the colorful Buddhist prayer flags decorating the Tenzing Norgay stupa and started the steep, deep descent to the Kumitanga River to cross yet another suspension bridge before the brutal climb up to Tengboche. We would lose almost a thousand feet and gain another 1,200 feet in less than four miles. Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world. All along the trail, we found pleas for donations for many different projects. The most common was soliciting funds to help improve the trails and to make life to, of trekkers easier while providing employment and other benefits to the people who live in the region. We gladly made small contributions at many of the solicitation posts. But I want to read this to you. This project is not government funded. I want off sea along this way is very easy and comfortable for these trekkers who come to visit Mount Everest region. You are a little bit support will bring great effort to make comfort project this way, not support to us. Your could be very good, please donate or if you don't like it, please do not donate because people must do this thing which are pushed from your own heart. As the sun was beginning its last hour, gently sliding down the cliff of the blue western sky, we walked through the gate and passed the row of prayer drums into Tengboche. Ramesh checked us in and I made straight for the room. Exhausted, I plopped down on the bed, barely releasing my hiking poles and too tired to remove my boots. All I wanted to do now was sleep. All of a sudden, Ramesh burst into the room. Come, he said, you must come quick. We must go to the Buddhist ceremony in the monastery. I want to sleep, I croaked. Come, you must see the ceremony. The prayers are starting now. I reluctantly crawled off the bed. We climbed the steep incline behind our tea house past a huge shrine of Mani stones with the Om Mane Padme Om Mantra prayer carved deep into the ancient rocks. We walked through the monastery gates, two golden lion statues standing guard, their gaze fixed on the beautiful Himalayan splendor in the distance. The reverence in the Tengboche Monastery was palpable. I felt the presence of a very strong force in this place. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and my whole body contracted into cold, pleasant tingles as I felt the power of these devoted monks. Spirituality. The room filled with a soft, monotonous, rhythmic drone, ancient words, the meaning of which I could not possibly understand, but the spirit of which drilled down deep into my soul. To look at the Tengboche Monastery, sitting on the highest knoll in Tengboche atop the massive stone-carved steps was impressive. But to stand on these steps and look over the valley was an extraordinary, indescribable feeling. The sunset was casting the most incredible glow 
on the snowy peaks of the giants of the Himalayas. I did not leave until the last ray of the sun disappeared behind me, the mountains etched in amber against the western sky. As the moon rose over Amadablam. During a noisy dinner in the crowded dining room of our tea house, the Hotel Himalayan, warming ourselves at the yuk dung stove, we discussed our physical condition. I was beginning to hate these ever-present noodles, but knowing how important nutrition and hydration were, I forced myself to eat two helpings and drink a half liter of water along with several cups of sweet ginger tea. We took stock of our health and I realized that we had been pushing very hard. I felt better, renewed by the heat, the ginger tea and the garlic noodles, but maybe it was the Buddhist prayer ceremony where I offered my own prayer for our safety as the sunset experience lingered in my mind's eye. All night I could hear Al coughing through the paper-thin walls of the cold, unheated rooms. I had to get up in the middle of the night for an unexpected diarrhea call and to empty my pee bottle. Walking past their room, I was afraid that Al might not have had any sleep yet. I emptied my pee bottle in the hole in the floor and as I broke through the ice on top of the flush bucket, I wondered how long we would be able to endure this torture. I was just waking up at about 6 o'clock when Pete and Roger came in to tell me that they've decided that they could not keep up the pace. We're really sad to say goodbye to Pete and Roger, but I think you have a whole new adventure ahead of you. A different adventure. Different adventure. That's awesome. Yeah, we're not the One least. We're looking forward to. And we will miss you. We're not the least well, bit discouraged. Right. That's no. What with six packs, right? That's right. Not. We set off on our fifth day's trek on the way to Everest Base Camp from Tengboche to Ferice. The goal was to make it to Ferice by nightfall and then to push on the next day to Lubuche. If we could do that and not take the extra rest day at Lubuche that most trackers take, we would be able to make it to base camp and back to Lukla in seven days in time to meet Roger and Pete and catch our flight back to Kathmandu. We climbed most of the rest of the day with the white snow-capped pinnacle of Amadablam in front of us, beautifully offset against the clear blue sky. I came across Al sitting on a rock. I plopped down next to him, thankful for an opportunity to rest. How's it going? I asked. Isn't this the most beautiful scenery you have ever seen? He answered, erupting into a cough. Late afternoon, we arrived in Ferice and checked into our tea house, the Pumori Lodge and Restaurant. I was exhausted and spent to my limit. I visited the very basic toilet outside the tea house since I thought that it wouldn't smell quite as bad as the communal toilet just off the main dining room. It is amazing how one's already diminished appetite disappeared when one sat by the yuck dung fire and got a whiff from the well-used toilet. At sunset, with the temperature plunging to below freezing, we had an early dinner of garlic noodles or rice and went to bed exhausted. I was thankful for the small, hard bed in the freezing room as I drifted off into a dreamless sleep. Cold and dark in a small guest house at almost 14,000 feet in the Himalayas, Al lay on his bed in the room next to Kent and mine. He was coughing severely. Just as I mentioned to Ken how worried I was for Al's health, Kathy came into our room and told us that they had decided not to continue the next day. Kathy is a nurse by training and had brought a stethoscope. Listening to Al's chest rattle as he struggled for breath, she knew that action was required immediately. The Himalaya Rescue Association Clinic in Ferice is staffed by international doctors on a rotation basis studying high altitude sickness and providing free medical services to the villagers. The Everest Memorial sits in front of this clinic. The structure pays tribute to all who have lost their lives on Everest. Kathy and Ramesh took Al to the clinic where Al was diagnosed with AMS. He was kept at the hospital overnight and the doctors ordered a helicopter from Kathmandu it was expected to arrive at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. After the usual morning difficulties of breaking the ice on the flush bucket, brushing our teeth, using as little water as possible from our drinking water and getting dressed for the day, we went to breakfast. We said a second sad goodbye in as many days that morning. As the helicopter took off with Al and Kathy, 
I felt like bursting into tears. It was an impressive sense of loss for me to see the two of them disappear across the frozen valley and through the saddle between Pumori and Tamserku. Our six-pack was now down to two. We set off at a brisk pace by now walking literally on top of the Kumbu Glacier. By midday, we were on top of Dogla Pass. I breathlessly beheld the sacred holy place of mountaineering known as Chikpilhara, a temple here at the top of the world at just under 16,000 feet, honoring the brave souls who have died in pursuit of Mount Everest. We continued to Lubuche, our last stop before Everest Base Camp, scrambling across the glacial moraine covering the Kumbu Glacier, climbing over streams of ice and water. We arrived in Lubuche cold and exhausted. So any day that we arrive, we have either hot orange, hot tea, and it's amazing what that does. Yeah. It rejuvenates. Totally. Early in the morning, Ramesh woke us and gave us news that Al and Kathy made it safely to Kathmandu the day before, and Al was admitted to the hospital with high-altitude pulmonary edema, HAPE, a potentially life-threatening condition. But the altitude's above 16,000, and that's it getting was a gorgeous, really nice. sunny day, the air fresh, impregnated with the felt fire aroma of the yak dung fires in the tea house's pot belly stoves. The sun was bright, welcoming, warming. The mountain peaks, white snow and ice capped beauty was offset against the most amazing, impossibly clear blue sky. Kumbu, Kumbu Glacier. Kumbu Glacier. This beer here, Pumori, unmarried daughter, 7,165. He is a really strong guy. <laughs> Into this. More than I expected. Been, uh, His happiness no bound. Register hike. <laughs> Time to be here. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. We passed through Gorakshet, and for what seemed like hours, we scrambled over the glacial moraine on top of the Kumbu Glacier. We were really moving fast now. There was not much elevation change, but trekking above 17,000 feet was taxing. We needed to get to base camp and back to Gorakshet by nightfall, and it was already three o'clock. Ramesh kept pushing the pace. I tried to remember my resolution, the Swahili. Pole, pole, slowly, slowly. Plant the pole, breathe, step, step. All the time in my head, I was singing the Om Mani Padme Om Here prayer right on to the tune of the two Lajshari, Nesindor. As we approached base camp, the, the guy, words in my head changed to the Italian. Allal ba vincero. I will win. Win Cheryl. I will win. Okay, so we made it to base camp of Everest and we want to pay tribute to our friends who didn't make it. Yeah. Six pack! So these people have a big fierce of this smile. I took out my iPhone and called Katie in New York. Wonder of wonder, I had full reception, but I could not speak. I just babbled on about the enormity of what we had done, tears of emotion and release tension streaming down my cheeks. The emotional release was almost too much to bear. I was standing there looking at the snow blowing off the sliver of the Everest summit visible behind Lotse. I was thinking of how hard I had worked with my trainer Nick Piccolo, lifting, strength, core, how many 40, 50, 100 mile bike rides I had taken to prepare for this. And then I was thinking about how inadequate I was in spite of all that preparation and how fortunate I was that, through sheer determination and discipline, I was standing at my end goal. A goal set and met. Late afternoon, as the sun set over the mountains in the west, we arrived back at Gorakshep. I was feeling quite sick and could not figure out if it was from acute mountain sickness, AMS, or just extreme exhaustion. This was a most strenuous day. We covered ground that most treks would cover in a day and a half or two. 
I went to our room, crawled into my sleeping bag, and except for my boots, wore all my clothes. I still lay there shivering, my whole body taken over by a most disturbing, tingling sensation. I did not recognize any of these symptoms, but the severe, throbbing headache had me worried and fearing for haste, high-altitude cerebral edema. I was quite certain that there would be no way I could attempt the 18,400-foot climb to the summit of Kalapatar the next morning. That would be a huge disappointment, since Kalapatar is the ultimate goal, even more so than Everest Base Camp. I was too sick to lift my head and ask Ramesh to take some videos and photos of the beautiful sunset casting a golden glow on the mountain's snow-capped peaks creating the most incredible photographic opportunities. After a half hour, he returned to show me the images. My eyes would not focus and I just wave him out of the door, my shivering and tingling body feeling like I was floating in the air. I am sure I dozed off during the night, but sleep was elusive. I could not breathe and I can honestly say that there were a few times during the night that I wondered if I would make it off this mountain. With my head spinning, nausea sweeping over me and my kumbu cough getting worse, feeling like my lungs would land in the bed next to my pee bottle every time I coughed, I suffered through the night. I thought Kent was doing well since his snoring never diminished, no matter how loudly I barked in the cold, hard bed next to his. And here I thought I was the only one who snored. At 6 a.m. I heard Kent move around the room. I was exhausted and confused as I tried to focus my eyes, stinging from the lack of sleep. What are you doing, Kent? I asked. Kalapatar, he said. I lay there, unable to process what that meant. Finally, I said, I don't understand. Can you tell me what's happening? Today is Kalapatar, he said. I wondered about that some more and then realized what it meant. Oh, yuck, poop, I said. Kalapatar. I jumped out of bed, put my boots on as quickly as I could, and feeling quite dizzy, my gloveless fingers aching from the cold, I packed my backpack, brushed my teeth, broke the ice on the flush bucket, flushed the cold porcelain hole in the ground, washed my painfully cracked hands by now almost bleeding from dryness, and made my way to the dining room. After breakfast, I felt a little bitter, and we started our climb up the steep mountainside of Kalapatar. Yesterday was a most strenuous day. We covered ground that most treks would cover in two days. I took it easy as Kent and Ramesh made it to the summit. The air was thin, but I was feeling stronger with each step, keeping my pace, remembering that the goal was to summit Kalapatar. We were in the middle of a near complete circle surrounded by the highest mountain peaks in the world, witnessing an avalanche cascading down the side of Mount Everest. Mount Everest, 29,028 feet, Lotse, Nupse, Kangaste, Kumbutse, Amadablam, Tamsergu, Kantega, Kusumkangaru, Konde, Tawache, Cholaste, Pumori, all of them over 22,000 feet tall. To see this view was for me a lifetime high, likely impossible to ever be matched in the time I have left on this earth. Reluctantly, we left our perch on top of Kalapatar and started our return trek. It took five more days to get down the mountain. We trekked through Gorakshep and Labuche to Furishe, and on to Tingboche and Namche Bazaar, where we met Peter and together Roger. we trekked to Lokla, the following two days. Then we were stuck in Lukla for three days, but that is a whole another story of frustration, pandemonium, and chaos. We escaped by helicopter in time to catch our international flight out of Kathmandu the next day. Hello, what do you guys think? We made it guys, we're here.
I'm very happy we made it back. It was as hard an adventure getting in and out of the mountains as it was to get to the top of the mountain. We made it back into the chaos of Kathmandu and after a farewell dinner hosted by Rampal Hari and Himalaya Journeys, we ended up at a pub where many Everest expeditions start and finish, the Rum Doodle Bar. It was our last day in Nepal. We made it back to Kathmandu with one day to spare. Tomorrow we will begin the long journey back to the United States via Tokyo. The Bagmati River flowing through the center of Kathmandu is a holy river for both Hindus and Buddhists. It leaves Nepal to eventually flow into the Ganges River in India, another extremely polluted river. As we were sitting on the banks of the river at the Pashupatina temple, we witnessed several cremations, a huge fire made on a platform with the body placed in the fire, the shroud in which the body was wrapped and every other item to do with this funeral was thrown into the river since nothing that came into contact with the body may be touched after the cremation. The river was almost stagnant. It smelled of sewage and did not look very holy to me. We were told that during the major floods each year, the river is cleansed and all the pollution is washed down to India. On that hot afternoon in Nepal, sitting on the banks of a filthy, polluted river in the heart of Kathmandu, I was overcome by an amazing feeling of gratitude and euphoria. I started to count my blessings, starting with the adventure I had just been privileged to complete. And then a floodgate of thanks opened up and poured into my mind as the funeral pyres gained strength on the opposite bank and relatives started placing bodies into the flames. And the lines of the poem I wrote on the mountain came to me clear as a lightning bolt. Oh, to once more gaze upon the glory of that mountain's grandeur and to caress the morning sun's life force perched atop Kalapatar, surrounded by those mountain peaks with the magical names, just once more. And I knew I would return. For me, trekking in the mountains provide an opportunity to evaluate what is really important in life. I learned three things on Kilimanjaro and found an amazing affirmation of these beliefs on the way to Mount Everest and back. Three life lessons which I strive to live, strive to incorporate in my life, my relationship with others, in my business as a financial advisor and life planner for my clients, and in my faith. I would have loved to have had as my goal to summit Mount Everest. But it was clear to me that that was beyond my risk tolerance. My goal was to reach Everest Base Camp, a much more acceptable risk to me. In life, we must understand our limitations but not be limited by them. Always let your grasp exceed your reach. I learned that it does not pay to rush up the mountain. Rather, one must decide on a pace which is acceptable, sustainable and realistic. Then one must develop the discipline to stick to that pace. It is unlikely that one would reach the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro or Everest Base Camp if one ignores this rule. No matter the elevation changes, no matter the severe climb up a steep mountain trail for hours just to descend hundreds of feet, followed by more uphill, one must stick to the discipline. It's funny that no one ever asks how we got down. The rules are the same on the way down. Set the goal, stick to the discipline, keep to the pace. I tell my clients, your assets are not the level of wealth you have accumulated during your lifetime. Those are your resources. Your assets are your family, your time, your spiritual and your physical pursuits. The journey down the mountain is often more challenging than the ascent. So set the goal, stick to the pace, get down safely. Thank you for the opportunity to walk this journey with you.